Man, I'm telling you, after laying there for four days trying to get over whatever it is I've got, some Wu-Tang Clan virus, woo, this is taking it out of me, but this is so much fun. Everybody enjoying themselves? Well, the 40 years of stories that Magic 105 created, of course, live very deeply in my heart and in all these people's hearts and apparently in yours, too. So let me introduce you to the next panel. We have some holdovers from uh, the first panel, but we've got a lot of new faces here that I know you'll remember and recognize. Sharon Anderson, one of our great promotion directors from the past. <laughs> Eric Johnson, best hair in the business. <laughs> Jeff Allen, best no hair look in the business. <laughs> Danny Joe Crawford, there's no, what can you say about Danny Joe Crawford? I've never written his entire name down in my whole life. Everything I've ever written is DJC. That's all it is. No right who. I actually thought that you were going to announce me as the Chinese gangster in love. Woo! There's only one person in the world that can call you that, and he just left. <laughs> Reed Mitchell right there. LaDawn Fuhr sticks with us. I'm looking past LaDawn. Carol Kramer is still with us. Treetop Trent Tyler. And Sharp Dunaway is still with us. I think the best way to explain why we divided it up into two is, of course, the long history of the radio station, but it was the logo change. LaDawn, who designed it? How did we start implementing it? Well, we, when I came on board in 1988, we were getting ready to start the promotion for our 10-year anniversary of celebrating rock and roll. And Dick had decided that, Dick Booth had decided that he wanted to freshen up the logo. He wanted a new look. I had a wonderful intern at Southern Magazine who did some really great work for me named Todd Phillips. And he, it took us nine months. <laughs> I said, we could have had children by now. It took us nine months from the idea pile to the, and Tom probably remembers this. I mean, Dick would literally take each incarnation and like, put it on the wall, yep. and step back and look at it. But I've got to tell you, and I, I've, been, I've been doing this business for a long time, it taught me a lot about how to look at a logo and what it means. I mean, a logo is your branding, it's your name, it's who you are, and it had to be on bumper stickers, it had to transfer onto billboards, it had to be visible, and it had to transfer into black and white. So there were a lot of different elements, but... And remember, this was 1989 going to 1990, and the logo that we came up with, uh, it, which at the time, the sign down there, which Stan Jackson, who's in the audience, yay, yeah, Stan, had helped, helped us uh, make. But the, the logo, and when we first did the first batch for the first year and a half, it said celebrating 10 years of rock and roll. So if, you've, if you have one of those bumper stickers or license plates or T-shirts, those are pretty classic because they're... We only did it for a year and a half. Yeah. Um, but it was really important to us to have a new look. and Same good music, same good people, but just a new look going forward. And also it was going into a new decade. So that's kind of where it came from. A lot of people, I'll be honest, a lot of people didn't like it. A lot of people grew to love it. <laughs> a lot of people, I love it. I mean, of course I love it. But a lot of people did grow to love it and wanted it and wanted things on it. And we premiered it um, at... The Rockin' on the River concert with Cheap Trick and the Romantics. There you and, go. And just to let you know, I was at the printer and at the T-shirt screener for almost three straight days before <laughs> that and walked out with all those T-shirts and bumper stickers because, you know, I had no staff. But anyway, but I'm proud of it, and it symbolizes the first 10 years and the next 10 years, and the next 10 years, <laughs> and so on and so on at Magic 105. Reed, did we ever do a logo, an official logo for Detour 105? How about Detour no. 105, everybody? <laughs> Groundbreaking alternative rock show that Reed Mitchell produced every week. We never did a logo. We just stole that and used the same slanted uh, Ah, font. yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the great, great promos you used to do for that show. He sent me a thing in Dropbox. I can barely use my cell phone, so Dropbox is a little above my pay grade. <laughs> but he sent me a bunch of them, and I figured out how to listen to them. And, oh, my God, I'd forgotten the creativity of that production. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of fun with that show. And, and you know, that was one of those things where we, Carol and I were just talking about all these specialty shows. And I know there were a lot of other things The David Allen did, you know, the Desert Island Discs and... and um, of course, the traffic jam, round bagger. He had all these specialty things. Yep. Uh, and it was really more about what 
the audience wanted, uh, you'd be at shows at Juanita's, um, and people would say, how come you don't play such and such a group? How come you're not playing anything by, I don't know, Robin Hitchcock or whoever it was at the time? And that's what really brought the whole idea to do the, the show. And the same thing with the Metal Zone. You know, we played some heavy metal bands or hard rock bands in regular rotation, but we didn't have like a constant, there's bands that weren't ever going to be more than a light ad. Right. Uh, you know, and that was a way to kind of showcase all of that stuff. And people loved it. And it was a lot of fun to do because mm -hmm. I'd go in there a lot of times and have zero show. And just let people start calling in, and it, you know, I couldn't get them all in in two hours. You know, so. that's exactly the way Clyde Clifford, who was going to be here tonight, he's got a couple of medical situations as he's dealing with, so wasn't able to be here tonight. But that's how he directed himself in Beaker Street. I he have to just jump in and just give Reed props, though. Reed literally launched alternative rock and roll in the Little mm -hmm. Rock market. He did. Oh yeah. He did absolutely. And, was and then it became mainstream, and we had to cancel it. I think because we were playing so many of those groups in the regular rotation by the yeah. end of the run. Right. I was having to look for stuff to play. I was throwing John Prine in there. Anything we weren't playing if somebody called up and asked for it. So, yep. you know. Yep. And I don't remember one of the promos. Sorry, LaDonna. This just cracks me up. When you said promos, Tom, all I could hear was one that Reed had Gary Thomas produced with him. That something about being spanked on the bare buttocks with a Tupperware lid. <laughs> and what, that's what I remember. That that's was one great. of the more improvisational pieces <laughs> that we did. We had a lot of fun doing these promos because, again, like we were talking about with the playlist earlier, and, and everybody's already said the same things that I've already said talking to other people about doing this thing, about you giving us a guiding hand and being a great mentor and a, a you know a coach since we're a team i mean you really kind of let us all kind of have our own ideas at the same time knowing when to reel it in or when to let it go um so thanks for letting me have the freedom to play a song called fucking shit ass at 148 a.m. <laughs> On a Wednesday, mo Life, Thursday morning. Sex and death. Yet, yet another story Tom's hearing for the first time. <laughs> so, Tom, it's just hey, like Eric, hearing your kids me, find Let's out go. when you were Santa Claus, they were hiding under the couch watching <laughs> right. you put the bike together. You know, <laughs> right. now I you're hearing it all. <laughs> I think I have that disc now in in, at, in uh, my office. <laughs> well, I'll autograph it for you. Cool. It has the live and the studio versions. That's right. It's awesome. Mm. My great uh, F-word story uh, of uh, inadvertently playing something on the air. It was in the brown bagger, and in those days, we were up in the Mayflower studio, and we had a turntable in the production studio, but not in the air studio. And somebody called and wanted to hear Jimmy Buffett's live version of God's Own Drunk. And I knew the studio version, but I had never heard the live version, and I thought, well, I've got that. Let me go see what this sounds like. Listen to the beginning, know how to fade it in. Listen to the end, know how to fade it out. So I thought, this is going to be great. So I walk in, I get it started, and I'm working on answering the phones and stuff, and suddenly I hear fuck in the lyrics the first time. And I'm like, well, that's probably not good. It's 12, 15 in the afternoon. Surely that's the only time he's going to say it. Oh, no. About three minutes later, it comes on again. How many calls did you get? I, I got enough that I had to put the phones on hold. <laughs> yeah. Because that was our trick, At 1.48 a.m., zero calls for fucking shit ass oh. to complain about it. <laughs> Nobody. Everybody that was up either didn't mind or didn't hear it. You know? Or were the people who called in for it before the, you two The played. Kroger stock guys. Right, yeah. right. Night, night crew at Kroger. <laughs> well, that was one of the things about the specialty shows on Magic 105. I think it made the station so unique and so listenable, and I never really had to do hardly anything. I keep getting all these props, and I appreciate it more than you know, but honestly, it's just looking in the eye of the person that's working with you and knowing you can trust them. They got good taste. They want to make the show great. Boom, let them go and let the show happen as it did. And, you know, I think it's funny, too, that, you know, people actually thought it was weird that I, I'd be out at a show at Juanita's. It's always say Juanita's because it seemed like we almost lived there with Benny Turner yeah. uh, in those early 90s years. But people would always, like I'd have a Who shirt on, and they'd go, what? You know, I thought Depeche Mode was your favorite group. No, right. I, was, I was a classic rock 
person. I love The Who and Cheap Trick and all those are, you know, my favorite by ELO, my favorite bands. Yep. But just like Carol did, we swapped shows a couple of times. Yeah. And I did the Metal Zone because you were off on a Friday night. I don't night. think I ever had dared do yours. Oh, come on. You must have done it <laughs> so, once or twice. I don't know. I don't think well, I, I did I the Metal Zone. Did. Yeah. I did the Metal Zone, and it was a blast. And people yeah. couldn't believe I was doing it. They thought there was some kind of taking sides of different kinds of music. But that's not the way it was back then. And, you know, even though we were a rock station, we had a pretty good variety of, of music. And listeners were pretty open, too. I got a few... You know, we played some of the electronic stuff on the show, and I get a few calls <laughs> knowing that was no guitar, bass, and drum right. thing, and a little concern about right. it, you know. Yeah. But nothing ever really, you know, nothing ever really controversial. I don't think I've ever asked you this question, uh, Trent, but when you came to work full-time for Magic 105, you'd already been a successful morning man in Kansas City. You'd been a successful morning man in New York City, and you came... Well. And you yeah, now it's been 16 years till I'm finally talking to a microphone again. So this is kind of weird. <laughs> well, everybody like knows it. who you are, and everybody remembers the great shows you used to do. What was it like to come back here and work for a kind of a loosey goosey formatted station, as compared to coming from New York City? Well, it was great because it is kind of loose, and I grew up listening to you. I mean, the Brown Bagger Request Hour was just everything. I loved it because you never know what you're going to hear. You got the concert calendar coming up, and it's all on our phones now. Uh, you know, whatever yeah. you want. But uh, it was great. I mean, I moved back. I take David Allen Ross's <laughs> job because he was leaving to go somewhere. I wound up buying his house and his car. Oh, my oh. God. <laughs> I'm like, crap, if I start growing a big mustache. <laughs> you, you bought the Valdez? Huh? You bought the Valdez? <laughs> yeah. The little white one? <laughs> I was like, man, about maybe I can share some of his girlfriends now, you know? <laughs> Didn't work out. I One of my favorite stories about you working at that uh, Main Street studio in uh, downtown North Little Rock. Everybody remember where that is? It's where, that's where Skinny J's is now. As a matter of fact, I think if you go to the men's room at Skinny J's, that's my old office. <laughs> it is. I actually yeah. started in radio a, in that right. building because you guys will love this. I started in radio at an easy listening station called KEZQ because I just needed radio experience because I basically stalked Tom. And he was just being honest, and I thought he was just being nice, because we all know he's so damn nice. <laughs> and he was like, Carol, I'd love to hire you, but you got to get some radio experience. I'm like, I will get radio experience. So me and my big hair, playing in bands and doing all the things that I did, go marching into playing elevator music at night. And so I finally get the radio experience, and next time I see Tom, and he says, next opening I have, I'm giving it to you. And I was thinking, oh, that was so nice of him. That's never going to happen. <laughs> he calls me at KZQ and just gives me the role. Um, working overnights. I almost passed out. That was absolutely like the happiest professional moment of my life. I was on cloud nine. And I worked six overnights a week at Magic 105, driving up to Mayflower for like the first half of it. And I, I would have, I probably, don't tell Dick this, but I probably would have done it for even less money. That is, oh no. That's <laughs> a brutal air shift. There's the only thing more brutal than doing overnights is doing mornings when you have to get up at 4.30 a.m. And the uh, studio in Argenta you were talking about, I mean, in the sun, in the afternoon, that place would be bacon. Yes. It was a very hot building. Yes. And sort of a homeless problem right around there. I got to the station one day. It's like, how'd that dog crap in that corner like that? Man, that's weird. <laughs> Dogs crap in corners. <laughs> so we're probably paying, uh, Trudy would pay the guy five bucks, a uh, homeless guy, to take it. You know it was probably just him making five bucks a day, picking up his own crap. <laughs> but true, it was so convenient to the checkmate, you know, back in the days. So oh, we my God, the checkmate. <laughs> nickel drink night, ladies. Nickel drink night. Funny, you can't spell checkmate the without the letters STD. Oh, wait, maybe you can. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> We're really divulging. I was just itchy and scratchy for a little while. Jeff, you had a few special shows that you used to do at nighttime, but they weren't necessarily music-based. You're most famous maybe for live Saturday nights yeah, with Joe Which Maggie. is actually still in the air. Oh, yeah, are you still doing it? Yeah, I'm still doing it. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and that was Joe's idea, and Joe and Sharp actually started that show because Joe had a huge live music library, and Sharp kind of thought it was cool to play live cuts on the air, and it <laughs> yeah. became its own thing. Yep, and it was every week for two hours, I think. For two hours on Saturday night. Actually, I'll, I'll take responsibility for doing something. I talked you into killing Inagata De Vita so we could have the whole second hour. Oh, man, I just had a guy <laughs> ask me to tell the story behind Inagata De Vita. It's, it's his me. fault. <laughs> it's on me. That's right. 
I wanted to bring up, I was in, in the transition period from Anderson Drive to Main Street in North Little Rock, so I saw both sides. They were talking earlier about the bathroom songs. And if you remember, Dick didn't trust the part-timers enough to have keys to the, the office in the Simmons Bank building. Oh, my God. So I remember Reed, you know, he'd have to prop the door open if he wanted to run down the hall to the bathroom, and the cleaning people shut the door behind him one night. Oh, my God. And he had to run down to the convenience store to call Carol. Can you please come <laughs> I think it, I think it was during like a classic album, you know, where you have a whole side of the album to right, play. So, right. And we, a lot of times we did CDs, so it would just keep going. But sometimes it, we were still playing them on vinyl. So. And keep in yeah. mind, there's oh, yeah. no cell phones. So I, we had that with you one night. Reed got locked out. I had just driven home. There was no way for Tom to reach me. Anybody to reach me, you know, until I got home, so I get all the way to my apartment, and it's okay. Hey, Carol, Carol was the closest. <laughs> Can you go yeah, all the way back up Highway 10 and let her? I was like, oh my gosh, yes. But it was, yeah, you had to be really, really careful because that door had shut behind you, and you were done. We had one key that we hung in the studio, trying to wear it like a like a leash or like a, yeah, but it's like put it on. <laughs> I remember that. But I, oh, it was so easy I to get locked about out. That. I yeah. forgot about but that. Tom bringing up the specialty shows, you had so many. You mentioned the Floyd fix too. David Allen did the Floyd yeah. fix, and, yeah, and get the let out all those. Uh, mm -hmm. I've worked for other program directors. I want everybody out there to know this guy is the Michael Jordan of program directors. He mm. is the GOAT. There has never been another one like him. Thanks, Jeff. Well, I, I was going to say about the uh, specialty shows that were non-musical. Didn't you have Blow Me Fridays? No, Tommy had Blow Me Fridays. Oh, did he? Was he the one to add that? <laughs> Tommy was one I don't know why I attributed that to you. I came up with the idea that Monday's the worst day than Friday, so I started the Kiss My Ass Monday. That's what it was. That's right. And the phones lit up. They did. And I, I had people of different colors calling in. I had people uh, from all walks of life that were just getting a kick out of being able to say that on the radio. <laughs> the best one, though, uh, Zach Wilde brought uh, Black Label Society to Juanita's while I was doing that show. And he came up to the station to do an interview with me on the air while that show was on. And he got the biggest kick out of being able to answer the phones. He sat in there and hosted that show with me for an hour and a half and answered <laughs> phones. That has happened so often when, when rock stars would come up to the radio station. I remember two specific items. One, when Joe Elliott from Def Leppard came up because yep. they were going to be uh, at uh, Barton uh, Coliseum. And we were going to do our standard little interview. But somewhere along the line, he mentioned that he had been on the radio in England. I used to be a DJ. That kind of thing. <laughs> And we said, well, you want to you do it now? we we'll give you an hour guest DJ show. And he just lost his mind. Yep. He said, yeah, really? Anything I want? Yeah. Answering phones, playing songs. He was just, I guarantee you, he never had a radio interview like that before. Never. And that, that speaks further to why they remember Magic One. You know, rock stars yeah. and other parts, they remember that because we did something special for them. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, as we think about the morning show, the rock and roll breakfast, who do you think sitting on this panel that was a part of that show for many years I can't call him the Chinese gangster of love. Tommy could, but this is Danny Joe Crawford right here. You, you were asked to do some crazy stuff. Well, you know, I started off just as a uh, stunt boy. The funny story, I'm just going to go ahead and bring this up uh, as Sharon is sitting over there. So I was managing a movie theater, and uh, Sharon uh, started doing these movie premieres with Magic 105. And so... Uh, that was back when uh, Tommy would actually go out and do things. <laughs> and so I can say that I worked with him for a very, very long time. Okay. And so uh, he would go out and he would host these movie uh, premieres. And, um, you know, uh, one of the things that I will always remember, uh, one of the movies that did was the Jerky Boys. And, and Sharon's got a side story about that. It's really funny about that. Uh, but uh, so Tommy invited me. He says, hey, why don't you come up, you know, and. You know, we'll do this and that. Because one show that he did at the movie theater, there was nobody there. Nobody showed up except him. And uh, this is during the Rock and Roll Breakfast, the high peak with Big Dave. He didn't show up. And I don't know if you were supposed to be there that day. But anyway, so he invites me up. And uh, I see him again at the next movie premiere. And he's like, you know, hey, didn't I tell you to come up? And I was like... I thought you really shouldn't. I mean, I thought you were kidding. I, you know, just, yeah. yeah, sure. So I finally came up, and the day that I came up, both Michael P. and Big Dave were out that day. So it was just me and him. And uh, then I, he asked me to start doing things, you know, crazy stunts. And uh, there was several that I did just for the hell of it because I was like, oh, shit, I'm on the radio. And then uh, <laughs> Tom Wood said that uh, I'm going to pay you 50 bucks for every stunt that you do. I said that? Yes, you did. And I got a check. I'm sure Trudy signed it. Granny, you signed those checks. I cashed every last one of them. 
And, uh, you know, and that's, that's how my career at Magic 105 started before I got on full time. Wow. But, uh, you know, that's, that's how it started. But, I mean, I know y'all don't want to hear that. Y'all want to hear, like, the good shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, I want to tell a real quick story. We talked about this on the podcast that uh, Sharp uh, hosted with me and Tom Wood. Does anybody remember the Magic 105 uh, golf tournament in Cabot for oh Make a Wish? Boy. All right, I'm going to tell this story. Who remembers that? Okay. Well, I know Dan Chapman. Freaky, you're out there, okay? This is a true story. There was a <laughs> caller that called in and said that didn't happen. That is a load of shit. I can guarantee it happened. I'm fixing to tell this story right now. We're doing a golf tournament. John Daly, who happens to be, you know, one of the biggest uh, icons from Little Rock. I mean, excuse me, from Arkansas, at Dardanelle. And obviously, he was tied very well with Make-A-Wish, okay? Make-A-Wish has this golf tournament. We're raising money. But obviously, it's the Rock and Roll Breakfast golf tournament, Okay. Basically, that means uh, it started off with a very small golf tournament in Heber Springs. It was called the Titties and Beer t Golf Tournament. <laughs> it moved over and got a sponsorship with Make-A-Wish, where we started raising money for Make-A-Wish. And what happens is John Daly uh, wants to do this, and Tommy's like, oh, we'll get a bunch of strippers, okay? So there's strippers at every hole, no pun intended. Okay. The beer cart drivers are strippers, okay? And yes, somebody said Miss Kitty. That's absolutely right. Miss Kitty's that was out in Mall Mail supplied all the strippers, okay? Now, I'm going to, and I'm not going to go as long as uh, Sandy O'Connor with my story, <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this uh, short and quick. John Daly, and I believe it's hole number 17. I may have said 16 uh, two weeks ago. I believe it's hole 17. It's a... It's 16? See, I thought that was a par three. But it's a par five dogwood right. And uh, Tom will know that John Daly has got one hell of a drive. So you basically paid uh, Make-A-Wish for John Daly. You made a donation for John Daly to hit the ball from the tee box, and it landed on the green, okay? Yes, that's correct. Now, what ends up happening is there's a lot of malicious activities that will go unsaid with uh, all these uh, naked women on the back nine, okay? For Make-A-Wish. For Make-A-Wish. Yeah. And we raised a whole right. hell of a lot of money, okay? Instead of buying mulligans, you bought other things, okay? Oh. I'll go ahead and say it. You had, you had guys that would lay on the ground, and women would pour the beer down their front, down everywhere else, and I'm going to be respectful because Granny's sitting right there, okay? Too and late. that's how we made a lot of money for Make-A-Wish. But John Daly's ex-wife, and I don't remember which number it was. I think it's number two. She was about six to seven months pregnant, okay? There, who remembers Trash Man? Yeah. All right. God rest his soul. Okay, he was driving the golf cart, and... John Daly's wife found out about what was going on down at hole number 16, 17, whatever the hell it is, okay? And uh, she gets in the golf cart. Trash man's driving her down the hill, okay? She sees the stripper. She eyeballs the stripper. And remember, she's six to seven months pregnant. She jumps out and rolls because the golf cart is moving, okay? And literally, as... She was rolling down the hill, okay? It's, and I'm not making fun of pregnant women, but it was pretty damn funny. She gets up, right hand fist, pow, hit the stripper, fell on top of her, and was beating the shit out of her, okay? Now, us guys that are just standing there, we just think that, hey, it's kind of cool. There's a, there's a fight, pregnant lady on top of a stripper. Okay, woman ain't got no clothes on, all right? John Daly gets pissed off. He's got like a, a half a million dollar uh, golf cart. It's customized. It's a mini Humvee, okay? Air-conditioned sound system. After he breaks every one of his clubs and throws it in the water, he gets in that uh, golf cart, races back up to the uh, front of the uh, golf course, gets in his uh, mobile home. It's like $5 million. It's beautiful. 
and he like takes off, but I don't think that he knew how to drive the motor home because he took out a line of vehicles. Oh. And, <laughs> and what ends up happening is that we finally get the uh, woman off the uh, stripper. Long story short, I know it's too late. She ends up uh, being part of this mafia that ended up getting uh, Pat Platinum Plus closed down sometime uh, uh, later on. But anyway, so but that is actually a true story. Freaky, you get you vouch for it. Thank you very much. What the heck is going on here? And you're hearing this for the first time. No, I knew a lot of those details, unfortunately. <laughs> What a great reality show radio would have made. Oh, my God. And I want to say this, Tom Woods, you made me lose a bet because you were the first person to say fuck up here. I had money on Carol Kramer, <laughs> the mistress of metal, and all these guys up here said Tom Wood was going to be the first person to say it. I got to watch myself, man. I have a reputation, you know? <laughs> uh, the funniest part of that whole story was the two promotion directors going, oh, my God. Oh, jeez. We're just <laughs> smiling and nodding. Yeah, smiling and honest, that's right. When you brought up the Jerky Boys movie, that reminded me of a trip that Sharon Anderson and I took. We had the opportunity to uh, broadcast live from the Grammy Awards in New York City, and we were holed up at the Hard Rock Casino uh, in Manhattan for uh, how many days did we do that in a row? Three. Three days in a row, and the rock stars just coming by. We were by far the smallest market. Well, we showed up with a radio, uh, a microphone, and bumper stickers, and you had people flying their own planes in. Oh yeah. With wheeling in 23 pieces of equipment, and we're sitting back here going, "I said I'm going to get a box, <laughs> and I'm going to put the Magic 105 bumper sticker on the front of it, and you stand the microphone up on top of it." Right. <laughs> Funny thing was, Tom got. Some of the best interviews. Oh, man, we had Gene Simmons, we had uh, John Waite, we had Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett. Tom, we had five minutes. They literally timed you. Yep. And Tom got a 20-minute interview with Tony Bennett because he knew the music. Yeah, I think that was it. I may have been the only guy in the whole room that knew the music. <laughs> you were. It was great. How many times did he say fuck? <laughs> Tony is a surprisingly profane person. <laughs> he had so a very you. young wife. So <laughs> right, right. right. Oh, my God. Well, Sharp, uh, I want you to talk about another one of the specialty shows that became kind of a uh, signature for the years that you were on the afternoon show, and that's the Gonzo Rock Show on Fridays. Yeah. Well, much like what Carol did with the Metal Zone, I wanted to bring something like that to the afternoon show. We also did a show, I did a show with Eric called The Hard 120 yeah. uh, yes. back in the day as well. And what was funny about The Hard 120, if I could go there real quick, was that The Hard 120... I did the first hour, the second hour was Eric's. Obviously the second hour was incredibly harder than my hour, uh, which is okay. He, he was like a different, we were two different brands of people that went in there and did a show. He had his brand of metal, I had my brand of metal, and we just, and, and we let it happen. It was really cool. Um, but as far as the Gonzo, the Gonzo Friday traffic jam, it started out, as Tom said, if you, if you are, if you have an idea, go for it. And, and, I, and the first thing I was doing was talking about 80s music. And I did a traffic jam one time, and we were playing Come On Eileen. Yeah. We were playing Human League, Men at Work. And, and it was working, because what was cool about it was it was fresh. It was fresh to the ears at that particular moment, because, I mean, not, not trying to get on a soapbox here, but if you hear the same stuff over and over again, you're going to go, ah. But when you hear something fresh, it made you go, oh, even if it wasn't your favorite song in the world, it made you go, what the hell? And that's what I wanted the Gonzo Friday Traffic Jam to be, uh, much like what Reed did with Detour 105. You know, what the hell? When I, heard, when I heard Detour 105 for the first time, I remember hearing Man in the Box for the first time, and I thought, buried in my shit. And I thought, oh, well, Reed's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't long after that. <laughs> then, he played, then he followed that up with, you fucking shit ass. Oh, you fucking shit ass. Oh. <laughs> Great it's a weird song. song. It's a weird song. But, it demanded to be played. But the, but the, thing, that, the thing that I loved the most was uh, when somebody called me up and said, Sharp, you say your name too damn much on the radio. And I said, yep. And, <laughs> and he said, you need to stop. We know the hell who the hell we're listening to. And I said, okay, thanks. I played the call back on the air. And I said, well, we need to play a game with this. And we started the game called the Sharp Dunaway Drinking Game. And... Um, 
And if I said my name once, you had to take a little sip of whatever you're drinking. If I said my name three times, you got to chug whatever you were drinking. And, uh, and if you caught me saying my name three times at your parties, you got to make a rule. And so many people would call me on Monday and go, dude, she got me so fucked up. <laughs> and I always told people, I said, you can play with alcohol or you can play with sweet tea. I don't care. Do you want to get drunk or do you want to piss a lot? Take your pick. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> Hold up your drink. Sharp done away, sharp done away, sharp done away. Go for it. Sharp and Eric have Two a, guys a, a connection beyond the radio station, too. You guys have been in bands together. Do you still play together in any bands? I, don't, I can't keep up. Oh, no. Eric's totally upgraded from me. What are you doing now, Eric? Um, I mean, musically. I don't give a damn what you do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, it's like that. Uh, let's see, musically. Well, you know, we, we had this, this group together for a while called the Screaming Santas. Yes. It's kind of this, this uh, heavy metal Christmas thing. And then there was this group called the Trans-Siberian Orchestra that just completely overshadowed it. <laughs> Bastards. Um, they were all right. But then we, I, I started uh, Bombay Black, and we had uh, Sharp and Daryl, and they, they moved off to do Dirty Lindsay. Yeah. Hell Yeah. And then, uh, I don't know, Bombay, we went on, we did, uh, we're trying to get album seven done, but we, we ended up playing a bunch of different festivals, and, and it's weird to open for bands. I used to go see at Barton, yeah. sometimes after getting tickets from, from Tom or, or Tommy. Um, so yeah, I mean, the guys I used to go see back in high school, is like Winger, L.A. Guns, Cinderella, uh, Bullet Boys, maybe I shouldn't mention that one. <laughs> Firehouse, a lot. Uh, we actually we opened for Cheap Trick a few years ago, which was awesome. What a great band. Not to mention, there's nothing quite like you're up there. Now, if you've ever been, been to Magic Springs, you know the band shell faces the sun. So while you're up there, the sweat is just doing this. And what you don't see, the reason why all the rock stars wear the glasses because they can't see a thing and they don't want you to see their eyes are just in pain. Mm -hmm. So we're up there, we're doing our thing, we're playing. I look over to the side and there's Rick wearing the full suit, wearing the coat and everything. He's up there just, just getting off. I'm thinking, dude, you're going to be dead in an hour. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's what I did in music. And I'm still doing album projects here and there. And, yep. and he's in a band called The Resistance that's... Nice. And doing that, and uh, actually I just started uh, with another group uh, backing up a, a really awesome country singer named Ryan Harmon, mm -hmm. who's here this evening, he's back there. Nice. You'll, you may possibly see him on American Idol. Possibly. Not the only two musicians in the group either. No. Reed's playing all the time too. Yeah, yeah. Reed yeah. does a lot of awesome stuff. Yeah, well, I Especially play in a band water. called the P-47s, mm -hmm. and uh, we've done a lot of the things like opening for people in clubs around town like uh, John Spencer and Horton Heat, uh, Webb Wilder, if anybody remembers him. Mm -hmm. and human it's Cannonball. It's fun stuff. Yeah. Yes, Human Cannonball, which still sounds great, even as a three-piece now. Great, great song. Uh, sometimes when we meet these rock stars, get the opportunity to meet them at the radio station, they end up becoming longer-term friendships than you'd think. The Cinderella friendship that you've created, Carol, is fantastic. I still have my Cinderella friendship, yep, which is really fantastic. It. As a matter of fact, I'm on um, Facebook with my buddy Eric Brittingham, and I just, on a whim, in the, in the zeal of planning this, I just did Facebook Messenger, and I wrote him, and I thought, you know, I really, I've been on, you know, you're someone's friend, but, you know, so what? You may not even remember, because it was a million years ago. Um, but I wrote him, and I just said, hey, you know, you spent the entire night on the air with me um, in the late 80s. I don't know if you remember for sure, but it's a really special radio station. We're commemorating the 40th anniversary. I would love it, you know, if you could swing into town because he lives in Nashville now. He wrote me right back. Oh, my God, Carol, that was the most fun ever. <laughs> I had the best time. Um, he's just a very sweet person. He he's not what you would expect. And if you're looking at old pictures of Cinderella, he's the one with the giant blonde hair. He's real tall. Um, and, you know, I, and I just thought it was so cool that he, he would have loved to have been here. He was um, doing something out with Brett Michaels this weekend. So he wasn't able to come, but he was really thinking about us, and I thought that was great. And just a moment for that evening, because Casey Jones, who I'm really mad isn't sitting up here with me. See, I already feel lost without her. Um, 
is uh, she really made that evening happen. Um, we had spent that night uh, out at the Magic 105 Haunted House. Oh, yeah. It was October. <laughs> And we had so much fun, and um, she was going to uh, the cellar, or the wine cellar, or whatever incarnation it was in, with a Memphis musician named Joanna Dean. She's a fantastic singer. Yeah. Do you guys remember that song, yeah. Kiss This, we used yeah. to play? Yeah. She's a very, very cool lady. And I'm on the air, and that's one of the bummers about doing overnight sometimes. You just miss some things that you really wish you could go, and I was just like, gosh, they're all out having a great time. And, oh, and all of a sudden, the door opened, and there was Casey and Joanna, and they brought Eric Brittingham with them. And the thing about him was that you would never know, because they all, rock stars look so confident, and you would see them on MTV, and they look so pompous, but he had a tremendous stutter. And he was just terrified to even get on that microphone. So we just said, cool, just hang out, we'll play around. The next thing I know, you know, we had two mics in the studio, and Casey and Joanna were on the guest mic, and Eric just piled in with me. <laughs> and we had so much fun. He was just out of control. I couldn't get him to stop talking <laughs> because we had uh, we had put him so at ease, and he was picking songs like by Alice Cooper that he wanted to hear. And and then, of course, to cap off um, the night, we went to eat at Denny's the next morning. And, and in classic moment, um, the waitress called Eric, ma'am. You know. Oh, great. <laughs> great. <laughs> Perfect. But again, Tom had called out, and it's so true. They just that that special, you know, real mm -hmm. people, rock stars, listeners, people who have the absolute honor of working for Magic 105 know that it's authentic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. from the heart. And we worked hard, but it was our it was so much more than a job to me. It's still to this day, as my resume is ridiculously lengthy at this age, the longest I've ever worked anywhere. Mm. And even uh, now that I'm in a completely different industry, I look for the vibe that we mm -hmm. had in any mm -hmm. company I work for. It's like, gosh, you could just be more like this radio station I worked at. You guys would be a lot happier. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so I ran that's into how Kelly special Bat is Tom, you cultivated that culture. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was so fantastic. Well, I just, I, maybe I had a knack for hiring the right people because if you couldn't trust the people you know, you could never have that kind of freedom. But I tell Tom, I don't know how you dealt with me. Because at 56, I look at millennials and I just want to murder them. Well, guess how old I was when Tom hired me? I was 25. And I was as high maintenance as they came. And Tom was so patient with me, despite all my shenanigans. <laughs> Thank you, you were, Tom. You weren't nearly as young as Sharp Dunaway was when he was sitting on the couch in my office there on Rodney Parham. And I'm looking at him going, this kid looks like he could be my son, but there's something there. I don't know what it is. Let's try him out on weekend mornings or whatever it was. And, man, that just paid off in... in I so bummed that interview. I have no, why I'm, I have no idea why I'm here. I See, I don't remember it that way. <laughs> oh, I was horrible. I was 20 years old panicking because I was trying to get a job at a 100,000-watt radio station after leaving a 6,000-watt stick in Salem, Missouri. Yeah. Excuse me, I can confess. After getting fired from a 6,000-watt stick in Salem, Missouri... <laughs> It should be noted that radio is probably the only industry in the world where getting fired is not a bad thing. It's actually a badge of honor, spoken about casually, and really doesn't... Oh, well, I'm like a five-star general. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not a detriment to your career. You just go on and talk about there's, it and laugh about it. There's a couple of people here in the audience tonight that came up and said hi. Jay Lambert and Jim Pagan from the Freds. Yay! fantastic band that we used to do a lot of work with oh, yeah. and when they brought me up yeah please they used to do anytime you go see a bar band and they do him 43 from aqualung you know you're in the right place <laughs> um but they brought me up a really cool picture and on the back of it is the barbecued bologna flyer and ladon you were <laughs> instrumental in making that very special day happen yes and it's funny you know sharon was telling me that dick used to bring her restaurant magazines to look at and i said well yeah because you know he wanted oh, you yeah. to find some, you know, groceries to do something. <laughs> because I stumbled on that accidentally because I had been dealing with Colonial Bread and Safe, the now defunct Safeway. And Brian Foods has a national barbecued bologna festival. And do any of y'all remember it? We did it two years in a row at the Little Rock Zoo. It was great. I mean, it was so much fun. We had, and, and I thought, okay, we'll have maybe five teams. I'm good with this because it was a, a fundraiser for the zoo. And until they started doing all these other fundraisers, it was the single most successful single day fundraiser they had every year mm. so that was good even bigger than zoo days which was shocking but it was on a nice sunday afternoon and we had the first year i know we had more than 10 teams and the media got very involved they came and and uh, made it, it's serious business to y'all if you haven't participated it's just like a real barbecue festival yeah 
the meat has to be stacked, you know, a certain way. The coleslaw has to be in there. And we got Safeway and Colonial Bread <laughs> to, to work with us and Brian. And uh, the zoo people, the zoo folks, had the most fun, I think, of any team. And they were came in second place every year. And I called them the always a bridesmaid, never a bride barbecue team because they never went. And I had this great, and I should have brought it somewhere in my home office, this great plaque they gave us that has the back of a, a an ass, as <laughs> a horse's ass. Here and it go. said, thank you so much, Magic 105, for letting us make asses of ourselves <laughs> and have so much fun. I'm quoting them. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was so much fun and it was so different. But it is a national ordained barbecue festival. Oh, yeah. And, and we did it two years in a row. And we did a lot of uh, flyers that we then turned into scratch pads that you probably still have one at your house. I know I do. Absolutely. Those mm -hmm. live on forever. They do. And you Todd Phillips actually. designed that logo, too, by the way. Ah. Yeah, along with Rocktography. He designed three of our logos. That, that was another thing I wanted to talk about was Rocktography and what a huge success that was. Rocktography. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and again, it was because of the listeners, because the whole idea it of it was at the State Fair, we would create this exhibit that was based on mm -hmm. your all's concert photos that you took. Yes. And we, Nelson Chanel was here earlier. He's a professional photographer, and his sure. photographs look fan. Oh, I can't even see these lights. Yeah, we can't. Um, his uh, photographs look fantastic, but you would be surprised at the uh, intimacy that can be gained from some of the. And this was before cell phone it was, cameras. Yeah, it was. It was. We still we had bag phones then, but um, when it was, this was my <laughs> second day of work, and I was proud of my bag phone. Thank you. <laughs> there was no camera on the bag phone. There was no right. camera or video on the bag phone. Hmm. Uh, but um, anyway, it was my second day of work, and Art Mirapol and Kelly Bass had had this wonderful idea to do a rock and roll photography exhibition. And so y'all brought me into the meeting with them. It's the first time I met both of them, and still friends with both of them. And matter of fact, Art Mirapol is sad he can't be here tonight. Hmm. He wanted to be here. Um, but... They had this idea to solicit photo concert photographs from, from listeners, from the public. And I'm good at naming things. I, I have a whole list of things I've named in my career. And in, in, in that meeting, I said, we'll call it Rocktography, and we'll get a metal building, and we'll make a studio and, you know, make a, a gallery out of it. And they were like, okay, <laughs> let's do that. And Jamie Lefebvre is here. We went out to Morgan Building. It was her client. And they gave us the building and... We got the lighting from somebody, but if y'all ever came to the exhibit, it was just like a New York gallery with track lighting. It was great. No one named Steve was involved in the track lighting, but track lighting and benches, and everybody's entries had to be formatted the same way so it would look, you know, the, the winners would look good. And we had sponsors, we had big media night openings, and it was the first exhibit you came to when you walked into the fairgrounds. And there's this Morgan building, but you walk in, you're just transported. And the great thing about it, again, was the connection between the listeners and, and the, the artists that they were photographing and then taking it back out to the other people who maybe weren't listeners or weren't music lovers who could appreciate it because we had huge crowds every night. And I actually have credited um, Hank, or Trent and Reed for helping me the first year so much because it was the first year I, I lived there. Carol calls me Miss Rocktography. To do she's that. a dash and a tiara. I did, and I waved. I, they, they'd give me a break because I'd be there all day and I'd go down the runway and wave. But, but, but the, the whole thing was is that, the, you know, and even then before we had photographs everywhere, that, that intimacy of a listener and a music lover taking those shots, those photographs, oh, yeah. And, and then displaying them and winning prizes, it was just special. And I have tried to replicate it in different places and tell people about it, but I just can't get people as excited about it as we got about yeah. it and as our listeners got about it. But anyway. It that was, was always the amazing thing to me about the promotion director jobs that you and Sharon, and there was a woman named Susan Cochran that did the job for a little while. Uh, she's in Texas now. But the way you would just take an idea and then gather together the sponsorships or the materials needed. The Voodoo Lounge, Rolling Stones event. This is a concert where the Rolling Stones are going to be playing at War Memorial Stadium, and we're trying to think of something that we can do beforehand. Sharon puts together this unbelievable nightclub kind of thing. Tell me about how that all came about and describe it for anybody who wasn't there. Speak. Um, <laughs> well, I think you and me and Dick, or Dick, 
the most appropriately ma named man in radio. <laughs> I'll just say it, because I had no budget. <laughs> um, <laughs> Poor off, Mr. Boone. Got off topic, sorry. Um, we were talking, I think, about what we could do, and I think they told me that I was doing a party, and I talked to my friend Beth at Budweiser, and she decided, or we decided, we'd put on a party for our thousand closest friends. Nice. <laughs> Which was a great idea in theory, but took six months. Um, I dreamed one night, because I was thinking about this all the time, of the entrance. Um, I just saw this hall with smoke, and then you walked in. Nice. And Beth, fortunately, had a, a carpenter who worked for them at Budweiser who built that for us, it had fog machines and lights where you could see to walk in, and you walked into this huge tent and the tennis courts that they were about to tear down, thank you, and we had our party. I did learn you always need more toilets than you think you do. <laughs> that was the lesson there. Um, but that was uh, fun. Uh, the fun thing that's evening. so amazing about it is the effort that was put into it for virtually 45 minutes. That's how long uh, people would about stay. an hour. Maybe yeah. a couple hours at the very yeah. most, but months of work go into something yeah. like that. But you know what? Um, I'm so fortunate to be up here with these folks. I mean, this was, I had never been in radio. I didn't even know what the fuck I was doing. I was just there. I just showed up and went, what do I do with these big, stupid eyes? Um, but these people, I would just have these ideas. And um, we'd just kind of fly by the seat of our pants. I'd go, hey, Troelius, y'all would go out there and it worked or it didn't, and then I got blind. We would just be the ones on the execution. You'd bring an idea, and we'd be like, okay. Yeah. yeah. We'd do CD preview parties in a parking lot and give away copies of the CD. We didn't know where that stuff came from. We just had something cool to do. You know, bus trips to a concert. Yeah, we'll host a bus trip. We had no idea from us how that all got put together. Brian well, McRae. It's hard, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Brian McRae, <laughs> <laughs> who used to do the promotion director job for a little while also, told me once he used to do uh, televised high school football in Texas for a television station. And he would tell me that the up until 30 seconds before airtime, it was complete chaos in the control room. Nobody knew what was going on. Somebody <laughs> wasn't where they were supposed to be. A camera's not working, the switcher's not working. But as soon as that light went on and the broadcast began, all the audience saw was the professional broadcast of a high school football game. And that's the way so much of our stuff was. Yeah. Well, when, when the audience showed up, when the listeners showed up, it looked really cool. But up until 30 seconds before that, we were losing our minds. Well, um, it's, like, it's like we talked about, and Tommy and I talked about this when he was here, and I shared with Tom. Tommy liked for everything to be spontaneous. I want it just to happen because he was used to, before I actually came to work there, we'd just get in the studio together and just have a whole lot of fun. I mean, I'd even go over to Memphis, and, and we'd have a whole lot of fun. But I knew it had to be different, and... and at first, when I first started, I mean, we were friends, and he, we were kind of buck, bucking heads because he thought I was becoming too much like Dick Boo. <laughs> too organized to uh, Yeah, I was too there. organized, and he didn't realize. I call it, you see the sexy, but this is the sausage being made. And uh, we had this big remote at um, McCain Mall with the NBC store. Jamie, you remember that. <laughs> Jamie LaFever is her client. And the, we were going to have a Stupid Human Tricks. And our winner was going to go on the David Letterman Show with other that. winners. And this was huge. But you're thinking about these people who are cracking eggs on their heads. The guy that, that actually didn't win but went to the, to the Letterman Show put a chain through his nose and ran it through his mouth. Oh. Tommy <laughs> called him the chain guy. But it was just crazy. And the night of the event, now we had been working on it for, again, like Sharon said, for months. Yep. And, and Jamie and I had been working with our client because there was also, you know, there's always, too, revenue attached to this. So we all have to be, you know, pl playing from, singing from the same hymnal here. And it was just, we had organized it to the point that we just had to open the gate and let it go. And it was, it was crazy that night. Crowd, it was crowded and wonderful. And the, the people doing the tricks were crazy and fun. And Tommy called me when I got home, and he said, oh, you're an apology. He said, I know now why you have to be so organized. He said, so it looks like it's chaotic, but you really know that it's not. <laughs> I said, thank you. 
Yes. Yep. Because you don't you don't know that's like you said. You know, you're looking for the switcher and they're Yep. But and then it just you know, comes up and Let's go down the drugs. line and ask if you remember names of jocks that worked at the radio station that were just for a short period of time or anything. I when I saw the in memorial that you did, is that the right term? In in memoriam. Uh, that you put together, Sharp, and I saw Chris Tigner's name. I'd completely forgotten about Chris Tigner. Chris was a great guy. Um, I remember when, and if I may be bold when I say the truth here, <laughs> when you Terrible hired him, voice. you said, there's no way he's going on the air. Yeah. He's just a board op because his voice was... <laughs> yeah, very, very high, squeaky voice. And I voice. loved him to death, but a great guy, but he had one of those voices that, you know, and it was real like that. But then you put him on the air, yep. and he didn't do bad. That was the bottom line. At the end, he didn't do bad. He did. He did. He was happy to be there, and it made a really you know. And I enjoyed listening to him. He was doing a lot of overnight shows. Um, an, another DJ that uh, that I that I think about is uh, Rich Richards. Believe it or not, because yes. Rich, Rich got me in more fucking trouble. Because he'd be at Queens Rag shows. Sharp, you were a jackass to me. I was. Yeah, I was at the Queens Rag show, man, and you told me to fuck off that you weren't you, and I said I wasn't me. It was a, just another redheaded guy, <laughs> and I, he got me in a lot of trouble. But I love you, Rich. Rich Richards was the only guy I ever knew that wore shorts twelve months a year. <laughs> Dude never wore long pants. No. You remember anybody, Trent, that we're forgetting to talk about? Well, as far as Rich goes, I do. He was a lot of fun to be around. He was. And what's so weird is back then we were doing the uh, cancer billboard. Yeah. Smoking cigarettes the whole time. <laughs> Wait a minute. About five Tommy years did the later, same like, thing. <laughs> Tommy did the same thing. Were we up there smoking cigarettes for, and everybody saw us on the university or wherever it was? Like, oh, cancer sucks. <laughs> exactly like that. Things are different now. <laughs> I awesome. smoked because Trent made it look sexy. And what the hell else Damn are you gonna straight. do in the over, And what the hell else you gonna do on an overnight shift? I just want to thank you for telling me that. <laughs> about that, uh -oh. smoking cigarettes uh -oh. at the okay. cancer uh -oh. promotion. Didn't make it to the back office, sorry. <laughs> well, we had Jennifer Trafford, who was on the air with us for quite a while. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, was Dave, uh, what's his name? Dave Calhoun. Yeah, Dave Calhoun, who's still around. Oh, it's a great story about Dave Calhoun. He was uh, doing an overnight shift. He was a weekender for us. Great voice, great guy. Uh, he's in video production, yeah. a high-level video oh, production. Yeah. Sharp's got a videography company right now, too, that does beautiful work. Um, Dave Calhoun one night, this is at the Main Street uh, studio in Argenta, and I get a call about 4 o'clock in the morning, and he says, Tom, somebody just broke in through the front window, and he's right here in the studio. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute, say what you're saying. And he was trying to tell me, and in the background I can hear this rattling around of fighting and stuff. So I jump up out of bed, got my clothes on, and drove down, and sure enough, some crackhead had broken through. Does anybody remember what the front of the place? It was an old department store, so there was a display window right in front of the studio where you could get through the first window, then you were in a display case. You'd have to come through the second window to get in the studio. This guy broke through the first window, through the second window, and was in the studio grabbing at his microphone. He called 911 first and then called me. All the while, this guy's in there. Sure enough, I got there in about... Ten minutes, the guy was gone already. The police got there faster than I did and found him a few blocks down, and he was just rattling windows. He was, I don't know what he was doing, but they arrested him, and Dave could have been killed that night. That's probably well, the guy that took the crap right up front. <laughs> <laughs> he thought Eric was on the air. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> uh, going back to uh, Chris Tigner, uh, <laughs> him and there was another person. He didn't work at the station, Monkey Man. Uh, when we were at the Clear Channel Metroplex, uh, Tigner was the overnight guy, and uh, him and Monkey Man would always have everything set up for me when I got in. Of course, you know, uh, the long intro, there's a story behind that on why the Rock and Roll Breakfast intro was always so long. But that was the overnight guy's job, by the way. I yeah, understand everybody that. I understand that. <laughs> but he was, I, he went above and beyond. and. Uh, talking about people that we haven't mentioned yet, uh, the Rock and Roll Breakfast. Um, I mean, you have to mention Big Dave. Um, Bill Downs. Bill Downs. Uh, obviously, we've mentioned uh, uh, Michael P. You got to mention Roger Scott. 
Uh, Nathan Christian, which I will forever remember this, the only time I ever got in trouble with Tom Wood was when uh, Tom Wood was given a phone call that I did a stage announcement at Riverfest that it, uh, I said fuck on stage, which I did not. Uh, Everclear had uh, uh, played, and for whatever reason, Nathan Christian uh, was up on stage with me, and he's the one that said that, but I always got blamed for that. But the only time that Tom Wood ever got on to me was uh, for that Riverfest incident. So, but, I apologize uh, for that. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good one because Tommy said, well, if Tom Wood chewed your ass, then uh, you're part of family. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it. that's right. But, uh, you know, there was a, there's a, been a lot of people, and I'm going to leave a bunch of people out, but uh, there's a lot of people that walk Gary the Thomas. Gary Thomas. Gary Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the longest Barry Mac. Yeah, the longest Barry Barry part -timer. Where's Barry Mac? Barry Mac. Yeah, Barry Mac Mac here? He's out here somewhere. I saw him. He oh, was Barry, wearing his here? white satin Magic 105 jacket. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. He does a great show for the new network that I'm working for, Arkansas Rocks. He does Tin Can Alley. He does uh, right. Barry Max flashback tracks. Great shows. But I think it's been, um, you know, said more than once, and I know that I can speak for everybody up here. Magic 105, there will never be another station like Magic 105. No. It was family. I yeah. mean, there's not a single thing that Eric Johnson, Jeff Allen, and I'm just naming the people that I worked with, Sharp Dunaway, Treetop, you know, and of course there's a bunch of people in the sales department, uh, all the staff there, there's nothing that they would not have done. And it was truly a family because Tommy welcomed me with open arms. I used to babysit his kid. Uh, Trudy Smith, I call her granny every time I see her. I mean, everybody is family. And I will tell you this right now, there will never be another Magic 105. No. Well, once again, like we did with the first group, uh, if you've got questions for any of the folks on this panel, yeah, Blake Woodson's going to handle this mic. And another Blake. thing, that the period that all this was happening was uh, the way the world was. We could just do anything, and it worked. Yeah. It didn't matter what. We, let's do this. Okay, it worked. That was one of the things. It that was always, amazing. It always blew me away about, especially Sharp is the first one I think of when it comes to this, but you were this way. Eric is this way. Every air personality was Reed. A f endless fountain of ideas and not really worried whether they were going to work or not. I had this thing in me that, that said, if you put something on the air, it's got to be on the air permanently. That's why Get the Lead Out ran for like 30 years. <laughs> That's why stuff that I would start, I would think, oh my God, people depend on it. We got to keep it on. But you guys, you'd come up with these ideas, try them. 80% of them would work, but the 20% that didn't never phased you. <laughs> you just come up with another idea, drop it, move on to something else. And if the audience wasn't responding, they weren't angry that it was gone, you know? So just that freewheeling, you can trust every one of these people that you're working with, let her rip, baby. But I think it was listening to the audience, too. I mean, we yeah. talked to people at all these remotes and, and all the events, bolt-ons, anybody? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that was the new logo. <laughs> <laughs> You know, all that kind of stuff. We just listen to people. And we are all music fans, too. Everybody that works, even the people that weren't uh, on the air, were all music fans and wanted to go to the concerts and wanted to promote the events that we did, wanted to promote the shows that were on the air and love the music. And I think that's really the yeah. common bond, you know. I just wanted to take just a sec. You know, you guys, are, you know, a lot of the stuff we're talking about is a little bit industry. Most of it you're probably you know, going, okay, I'm, I'm with what they're doing. But I just want to say Sharon and LaDawn, um, these gals, I worked with both of them, which is why I got the pleasure of getting to sit on both ends of this whole spectrum because I crossed over from the blue to the red and yellow. These ladies work incredibly hard. And, you know, teamed up with us, protected us from Dick when he was being really <laughs> horrible to us. He used to stalk me. He would listen. He would sit in his office, you guys, and watch his phone <laughs> because there were, there were two hotlines in the studio. I'll share this very quickly. Mm -hmm. One was kind of more public number. The one was the super duper insider. Nobody knew it but us line. Mm -hmm. But the one that was kind of you know, a little more well-known lit up in Dick's office, too. And he would sit and watch the phone. <laughs> and when he'd see me get on the phone, he would sit there waiting for me to make a mistake. I had it down to a fine science. And he got so mad at me one night because I didn't. He came in, damn it, I've been sitting here watching that phone. And I just can't understand why you're not screwing up. I'm going home. And I was like, wow. <laughs> this is so scary. But truly, to get back on point, they work so hard with us. 
they're creative, they, you know, come up with these ideas. All the appearances we did, a lot of them, we got talent fees for being at. They didn't get anything. They were there as part of their right job, on. working and working and supporting everybody from sales to programming. It's such an incredible role that they played. I just want to thank Sharon and LaDon from the bottom LaDon of my Fuhr, heart. Sharon Anderson, give them a round. Thank you. Great story about Dick Booth and a guy. Do, how many of you remember Kip Anderson? Did overnights for us for a while, and he uh, was disabled, had one arm and one leg. The guy got around incredibly. He was an amazing talent on the air, too, but he was late all the time. And it finally got under Dick's skin, and he, uh, fire, he, he called me in. He said, I'm going to fire Kip Anderson. I tried to talk him out of it, but he, he wouldn't be talked out of it. So he brings Kip in, and I'm the witness, and he tells Kip he's going to be fired because he's late all the time. And then he starts to try to give him work advice. And Kip stands up right in the middle of his conversation and starts walking out. And Dick goes, where are you going? And he says, you just fired me off listening to your shit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> My man, Kip Anderson. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yes, I see a hand right there. OK. I got the mic. It's hard to see. Hi. One of the really cool things about Magic 105 was the neat connection between y'all and the listeners, and that's what we've talked about a lot tonight, mm -hmm. between all the giveaways and promotions and events at Diego's and things y'all talked about. But one of the cool things, too, was in the mid-90s was the guest DJ y'all let on. Oh, yeah. I, um, I got December 1996. I got to spend an hour up there on Main Street with wow. Gary Thomas. I picked out the songs. He pushed the buttons. Yep. But really still one of the coolest things I've ever done. Really, really a fun time. How did that come about? And, uh, you know, talk about that a little bit. Just the, the knowledge that people would find it to be a cool thing. And we were trying to find, I think we did it for a while. We did it like at 10 o'clock Saturday nights or something like that. Yeah. Or no, that was. It, it was 10 o'clock Saturday nights. And then I remember it, for a while it moved to the hour before Beaker Street started at 7. Because we thought it'd be cool for them to be able to meet Clyde Clifford at 7 o'clock when they were finished up. It moved around a few times, but the basic idea was just what you said. Anybody who got an opportunity to do it, that would be a memory they'd carry with them their whole lives. It was great fun. We had to stop doing it because we had moved it to a later Friday or Saturday night and people were showing up inebriated and uh, <laughs> it got a little bit out of hand. And <laughs> we replaced the ceiling tiles a few times and said, all right, that's it. We're done with that. But it was great fun. And, and you're right, the listeners, the connection with the listeners was the whole ball of wax besides these incredibly talented people. I remember having uh, the band Hot Tuna. You guys know Hot Tuna, Yorman Kakounen and Jack Cassidy. They were playing at Juanita's and they were up one afternoon for an interview with me. And we were talking to them and we played one of their songs and the phone rang and I answered the phone and it was some guy who was unaware that we were interviewing Hot Tuna, but just wanted to ask for a request. So I wrote the request down, told him thanks, hung up, and the both of them looked at each other and said, he wrote that down. And I said, well, sure, I'm going to play it later when you guys are done. And they were like, that's unbelievable. We've been in 100 radio stations. We've never seen anybody write the actual request down. You're going to play it later. <laughs> Somebody had their, yes, sir. I was just going to say, uh, thanks to all of you. Um, Eric and Conway, I think I talked to every one of you at one time or another. Remember that voice, I, guys? <laughs> I've got a story on or about every one of you. I, I got to uh, wear a hard hat and become part of the percussion for Lord Tracy because of you. I've done that. Uh, it hurt. It was painful. Way oh, way oh, wanna, 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 way oh, choo choo. Mayonnaise. Uh, Tom sent me to uh, Memphis to see Bob Seeger. But the one thing I, oh, and the last thing that you brought up, uh, I might be part of the reason why Kip was late all the time because he just had one hand, but he could roll a joint better than I could with two. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you, all the stories you haven't heard, you, uh, you could see headlights coming up that big old dog leg <laughs> yeah. turn. And in the middle of the night, if your jocks might have seen headlights, they knew I had pizza, weed, or both. And maybe I picked <laughs> the music from two to four more times than you'd ever know. The, uh, <laughs> Kip Anderson's medical marijuana card number is two. Yes. Because <laughs> mine is one. Um, the, for the promos, who came up with the bright idea to put um, rat 
at the Pine Bluff Convention Center <laughs> and then give all your DJs a stack of tickets and say, pull over people that have Magic 105 bumper stickers and give them two tickets. Because <laughs> your jocks found out real quick, if you don't have blue lights on your car, you don't pull people over. So I showed up with two pizzas, and I left the Round Mountain Station with 20 tickets to see Rat <laughs> at the Pine Bluff Convention Center. Awesome. And there was a little no-name band that no one had ever heard of that opened for them, and I, I saw them booed off the stage so Rat would take the stage. This little band from New Jersey was called Bon Jovi. Oh, wow. And me and 19 of my friends saw them. Thanks to you. I will shut up. Thank you for 20 wonderful years. I enjoyed every day of listening to you. Incredible. Love it. Anybody else? Hey, Tom, that was the Bon Jovi concert I was telling you about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll leave, I'll leave the, yeah, I'll leave it up to you, Blake, because I can't really see. Trudy. Hi. Trudy. I just wanted to tell everybody that... Uh, I worked for Magic 105 uh, 22 years. <laughs> so, uh, wow. I took care of you guys 22 years. You don't know the times that I had to go to Dick Boot's house and get him to sign your paycheck so that you could get paid. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Wow. Because he has stayed out too late uh, with this after hour thing. But anyway, I just want to say I really do it, did enjoy working with you guys and I look at you as my children. Oh. <laughs> we, we, love we, you, love you, we love you, Trudy. Trudy, <laughs> Trudy Smith, Trudy, everybody. Trudy. I love you, Trudy. <laughs> Tom, I have one more story. Yes. Casey. Oh, Casey. She Casey, go. She's okay. the floor. Eric who just stood up, yep. was my first caller when I was on the air, my first night, and he goes, welcome, you know, to Little Rock. Um, my name's Eric, and so he ended up calling me every night. He was working as um, a, at the desk clerk in a hotel in Conway, so he called me every night. He'd bring pizza, you know. Um, one night he calls me, and he says, Casey, you're not going to believe this. I just got robbed. And I go, Eric, did you call the police? He goes, no, I called you first. <laughs> <laughs> Hang up and call the police. Oh, my God. <laughs> you were his trusted friend. <laughs> so that just freaked me out. Just, just Didn't you and Carol used to have somebody who would deliver you sandwiches from those little stores down there on 365? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Subway sandwiches. Reed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yogurt. Yep. Oh, man. Casey could work the food angle really well. <laughs> and I've got, Casey, I've got one for you that I just remembered. You and I bartering for um, food at the state fair with cassettes. We would literally go to, hey, Mr. Corndog Man, I've got this Guns N' Roses cassette. You want to feed me? We'd just barter. We'd barter our prizes. <laughs> you all, you all brought, brought me a cup of fries one night. That you <laughs> Which bartered. we probably traded yeah. a, yeah, you a had, cassette sure or you a had. CD yeah. for. Yeah. How many times did you go to remotes where you had uh, CDs or cassettes or whatever to give away? And there were all new bands that the people who came to the remote didn't know who they were and they didn't <laughs> care about picking up the cassettes. And then we ran into Bill Eganton at Arkansas <laughs> Record and CD Exchange <laughs> and started trading out advertising for classic CDs. Mm -hmm. And you'd go to remote with 20 great CDs, Black Sabbath, Rolling mm -hmm. Stones, mm -hmm. and they'd be gone in the first five minutes. Mm -hmm. People just loved them. Thank you. Well, Billy that turning point had to happen between uh, the, the Metallica concert when Injustice for All came to town. Because I remember you sent me to a Metallica concert with Chicago CDs. Ooh. And I stood up on a van, <laughs> and I threw them out. And you, and literally, they came back at me. <laughs> Sharp, I will never forget when we met Metallica, and Sharp's a drummer, as we know, and he about pulled Lars Ulrich's arm out of the socket, shaking it, and Lars Ulrich was just looking at Sharp like he was something he had never seen in his life. <laughs> just, wow. But I, I didn't get to be backstage with you at Ozzy when you introduced yourself to Ozzy. And I heard that you want to tell him that. But I did hear the oh, story. I'll make it quick. I, I love this. I, I, Ozzy's signing all these autographs, and he says, what's your name? Tom. Be to Tom. Best wishes, Ozzy. What's your name? Trent. To Trent. Best wishes, Ozzy. What's your name? Carol. To Carol. Best wishes, Ozzy. What's your name? Sharp. To Sharp. What kind of fucking name is Sharp? <laughs> I heard it. I heard it. I was right there. <laughs> he did. <laughs> 
If you've ever seen Ozzy's hand, I can't remember which one it is. He's got O-Z-Z-Y tattooed on his fingers. And I remember asking him, what, what is that all about? He's like, I can't remember my fucking name. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had a question over here. I, two, actually. First, I was going to say Sharp Dunaway. We made Gary Thomas absolutely hate us. Because when you would work weekend overnights, me and my best friend, Heather, would bring Sharp coolers of drinks we would bring taco bell whatever he wanted and gary was so jealous that no one ever brought him anything and to this day there are still people in town that think my name is patty not pam because sharp named me and heather peppermint patty and marcy (laughs) and then secondly i think eric needs to tell the story about the air check the infamous air check. <laughs> Here we go. Talk about the word fuck. <laughs> you got time. Five minutes to go, you bring this up. <laughs> okay. It's not really an air check. So we're over at the Death Star, also known as the Clear Channel building on Colonel Glenn. And we have this new system and uh, the next-gen system. It's really cool, and everything is digital. No longer do we have to wait for that extra-long song to go take a leak. (laughs) No longer do I have to wait for Inagata De Vida to be leisurely about it. No, we just let it play. You can pre-record stuff. Whatever. It's awesome. So, uh, actually, and I remember that many, I remember everything that happened because, actually, Sharp had uh, called me up and said, listen, man, because you were at a golf game, and you had had an, an attack. He said, man, Sharp, uh, Tom's been taken to the hospital. I'm like, oh, my God, Tom's in the hospital. What? No, he's freaking Superman. He doesn't go to the hospital. <laughs> so, no, he, he's gone to the hospital. We don't know what's going on. But listen, because that means that Sharp is now in charge. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he's like, so, listen, can you go ahead and do your show? Just record just do breaks all the way up until, I think it was like 10 o'clock the next morning. Wasn't it a Sunday morning? No, it was Saturday. Okay. No, it was a Sunday. I thought Sunday. it was no, a Sunday. It was, it was, it was, it was Sunday. Friday. It was a Friday. Trust me, I remember. Fight! Fight! Oh, fight, fight, fight! You don't forget fight, fight, something like cars. this. Jeez, brevity, Eric. Brevity, so, move it along. So 7, 7 p.m. Friday to uh, Saturday at 10. So... I'm cutting breaks and cutting breaks and cutting breaks. And uh, I came up to this time, I was supposed to do a break, and I didn't really pay much attention. I just knew that Sharp had a remote he was doing, and, and I just kind of went off and did my bit, and I was reading it, sort of half-assing it, and then suddenly I looked back over and realized, no, I've totally gotten it wrong. Well, fucking, fucking, fucking. I became very free of speech, and... Uh, yeah, so I played it back and got a great laugh out of it because it was a very honest moment. And I said, okay, well, let's re-record this thing and actually get it right. And this time I got it right, and it was on, it was there, and I tightened everything up and hit save. He just thought he recorded over it. Don't get ahead of me. (laughs) So I finished doing the rest of the thing. So I guess it was about 10.30 the next morning, I get a call from Sharp. Dude, do you know what happened? Well, at the time, we were working on the first Screaming Santa's record, and I thought, oh, maybe him and, and the bass player who was also handling the, the recording engineering, maybe they got in a fight, and I got to go in and finish it up. And he begins to tell me what happened. What aired at 9.35 on a Saturday morning. I said, fuck seven times and shit twice. <laughs> The girl I was living with at the time said I turned white as a sheet of fresh paper. (laughs) Just standing up. It's not, that wasn't supposed to happen. Listen, call call the GM right now. Call Signego. Talk to him. I go, okay. So I I call John and I let him, John's like, I I know, I I, I know. You wouldn't have done this. I, I know that about you. (laughs) <laughs> Listen, I'll fire sharp immediately. In the meantime, um, you're, you're, you're suspended from the air. If anybody asks, uh, can you come in uh, Monday, say, 7 o'clock? 
you bet your ass I can. <laughs> so 6.30, I show up, and I'm wearing slacks, the only pair of slacks I own. And I, I get there, and I check in. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Okay, very good. Just, uh, just hang out. I'm going to make some phone calls. I'm going to talk with Tom. And, uh, you yeah. know. So I spend the rest of the day just trembling. Because I'm, I'm thinking, this is it. This is over. And our esteemed production director, Bill Downs, of course, understanding the situation, understanding I'm nervous, comes up. You can still cut spots, right? <laughs> Thanks a lot for understanding my pain, Bill. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as it turns out, I could, sure, because <laughs> that's pre-recorded and it'll be correct. So about 4.30 that afternoon, I get called in the office and he says, well, Eric, how you feeling? Terrified, can we just get on with this already? <laughs> well, listen, uh, turns out they're, uh, they're chasing some bugs in the system. Uh, uh, when you start a track, do you ever hear somebody else's voice on there? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, that's evidently the problem, so uh, that's what happened. Excellent. Thank you, Bill Gates, because it was a Microsoft operating system. But, you know, Tom went to bat for me. You know, this man is, is my father in radio. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, and actually, I, we mentioned the Guest DJ Show. I started out on the Guest DJ Show. I was the first non-corporate sponsor. First guy to do it was the sponsor, Rick's Pro Dive and Ski Shop. Oh, yeah. I did it and then came back like three months later, did it again, ended up at Cool 95. Good times and great oldies. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, that's what happened there. So you jump all these years later, um, I... I ended my full-time radio career and went to work for myself doing voiceover, doing audiobooks and, and records and whatnot. And I get a call from Mike Kennedy over the point asking if I'd like to do some fill-in work. I said, sure. My first day, I walk in, filling I'm, in for Mike. He's I'm out of there in the your booth. Name. At, yeah, I, mean, I know you did. And thank you for that. <laughs> I walk in. There's Jeff. Hey, man, how you doing? Oh, by the way, check this out. And he's got it on the computer. <laughs> I hate to tell you, but uh, Gary Thomas has it, too. <laughs> and he came on after you that morning. I'm, like, not even working there anymore, but these people that are my family and friends, and Gary's like, oh, my God, Carol, you have to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> like, what happened? And it was like, oh, it was, I'm sorry, Eric, but I busted a gut. I laughed so hard. It, I'm just... But, but bless your heart. You, <laughs> bless it, your heart. Carol, Heroes above it. You're still here. I'll tell you what. I have never seen Bob Robbins cry. <laughs> Carol was around when the infamous Juanita's commercial was recorded. Oh, yeah. I, I know yeah, we did that yeah. one. <laughs> I hope that one still doesn't exist anywhere. It, it did I've appear at a it. Christmas oh, party God. one year. Yeah. <laughs> I'm we done. used to get crazy in the production studio and make these ridiculously profane commercials. I, Juanita's had a music bed, a jingle they used back in the day to record their spots, and Tom actually went in and cut a, a legitimate Juanita's commercial, but he put his own unique spin on it, let's say. Yeah. There were a couple of F-bombs, there were a couple other words, colorful, but it sounded like a real commercial. Because he was doing it just like Tom. Hey, everybody, it's a hey, great yeah. time. Woohoo! You know, we were like... This is the absolutely most bizarre and awesome thing I think I've ever heard. <laughs> hey, uh, needless to say, uh, voice tracking is uh, what ruined radio. Yeah. Boy, howdy. Yeah. <laughs> well, another radio station like Magic 105 I don't think is ever going to come along until all no. of us are long dead. So let's have a hand for these people who created it. <laughs> Sharp Dunaway, Trent Treetop Tyler. Oh, look at that. Wow. Woo! Carol Kramer. LaDawn Fuhr, Reed Mitchell, those shirts are used. Danny Joe Crawford, Jeff Allen, Eric Johnson, and Sharon Anderson. One more question, we gotta get out of here. Okay, last thing. It was purely since we know who killed it off, the Indigata de Vida that was our North Star on Saturday night, regardless of where we were, <laughs> camping, you know, partying, uh, whatever we might be doing at midnight on Saturday, <laughs> you know, we knew where we were. And thanks for fessing up about you no know, problem. Be, being the buzzkill. So uh, we were just wondering where that idea came from, and thank you for it. That was actually 10 p.m. 
Yeah. It was, and 10. it was 10 p.m. on a Saturday because I was the one playing it. And I don't think it was really any more inspired than the same reason for the guest DJ thing. It was just, this would be cool. Let's try this. And then we did it the second week and the third week, and then it's a month, and then it's a year, and it just kept on going. Final word, thank you all for coming out. It's great to see a lot of faces out here, as, as well as my family up here. Thank you guys for being yes. here tonight. Thank you, and thank you, John Miller, Central Arkansas Library System, for letting us do this. Be safe going home. Thank you very, very much for all the support all these years. We love you.